Hi everyone, and welcome to the ADGM Think Podcast Series. This is the place where those affecting the future of finance and tackling big issues like finance, economies, technologies, investing, entrepreneurship, security, and sustainability share what they really think. My name is Chris Hughes, and I'm the editor of Abu Dhabi Finance Week. It is my great pleasure to be with you all today. So, I'm sure you might have heard about a little thing called AI, the advent and impact of artificial intelligence and how it is revolutionizing industries. For example, the the biggest news story today is probably ChatGPT. It's just simply the most talked about tech of the year, probably of the decade, with hundreds of millions of active users, despite the fact that it's a relatively new technology. And if you're anything like me, you have spent far too much time playing around with it and seeing what it can do. But we are here today with the man helping to build Abu Dhabi's own version, the Falcon Large Language Model. Over at the Technology Innovation Institute that I've been familiar with for some time, they're doing incredible things. We have the Chief Researcher of TII, Mr. Marwan Deva. Welcome, Marwan. Thank you for the introduction. It's great to, great to have you with us. And we're going to talk today for about 15 minutes, so we don't really have an awful lot of time. I think having you know, researched you and, and spoke to you just in advance of this, I think you could probably give a, a two-hour lecture on this uh, this subject and, and still have plenty more to say, but we've only got 15 minutes. So we'll dive into it. And I'm going to set you a challenge to start us off. So imagine... I was a lot younger than I am, and I was a 12-year-old. How would you explain AI to me? So it's not very easy to explain AI, but basically the, the whole idea of artificial intelligence is about mimicking how human basically are behaving, meaning mimicking the human intelligence. So this is something that started in the 50s when people started to build computers, and one of the big shots in that field was a guy called Alan Turing, yes. in terms of, of trying to find a way on how these computers could mimic the brain and be able to react in the same way. And of course, this has been going since the 50s to several phases. We have what we call in our field winters. Winters meaning that a lot of big hype and then going down, a lot of big hype going down. And it's only around the 2000s that basically things have been going quite fast with a notion called deep learning, which came in. Okay, And this deep learning, of course, I think you saw it with basically beating basically what we call a certain player in a game called AlphaGo. So in general, intelligence is always related to the fact that, you know, you're better than doing chess. That was in IBM in the right, 90s. Okay. The, the Gary Kasparov exactly. story where they beat the, the grandmaster exactly, of chess. Exactly, exactly. Because intelligence is about smartness, and smartness yeah. is about, you know, what is smart is playing chess, playing AlphaGo, all these very complicated games. Making the right decision. Making the right decisions, being able to make the right move, and also being able to reason. And we'll talk about ChatGPT today, which provides some kind of flavor around those type of reasonings. Before, let's say, it was mostly about reasoning and learning machines. And now we, we're going towards a, a framework or where machines are a bit reasoning like us. And reasoning meaning that they can take strategic decisions, they can move around, you can identify things, objects anywhere. You're just like wandering like a human around you. Moving. It's fascinating. It's just, uh, it's obviously something, you know, just listening to you there that you're incredibly passionate about and knowledgeable about. But where, where did it come from? You know, if we go back in time, where did you first become aware of this field as as an area of science that you wanted to so that's a good question and i think this is very good to tell the audience ai is quite a great field for everybody because you can come in from every field you can come in from being a mathematician you can come in from a computer science background Mm. you can come in from a hardware background you can come in also from a law background so every person finds the piece of his cake in Mm. in that in that field and i think that's what makes it so interesting for many people because there's a lot of different things you can do. As far as I'm concerned, of course, I started by being a mathematician. So right, okay. My, my career started as a mathematician and then basically I decided after my studies uh, in France in, in a school called École Normale Supérieure Saclay uh, to start basically working on something called information theory. So information theory was, was a field brought by a big shot also called Shannon 
which was also a good friend, by the way, of Alan Turing, right. the godfather of AI. And the idea of, was basically of how you can quantify, express what we call information. And information is quite important. And so, of course, this led me to work many years as a professor and an industry in the, in the field of telecom. That was a big part of, of my career. And by working in telecom, of course, the interest in, in AI started quite fast. And around 2014, 2015, of course, a lot of work started in, in working on AI, and especially on these kind of neural networks, which are built basically to design systems. And these systems were designed, of course, to make better recognition schemes in terms of vision. So vision had a big thing. Speech recognitions, I think uh, you see it every day with Alexa and all the things of, of how the voice is recognized. Yep. And then being much more broader in what we call the verticals. Verticals meaning uh, uh, automotive industry, airplanes, uh, health industry, stuff like that. And so, of course, that got me into more working in those fields and trying to understand better how AI could be a big game changer in those fields by applying uh, these tools of machine learning. So it was helping industry, society make better decisions. Yes, definitely. And and I looked at that for more at the beginning is from an academic perspective, yep. trying you know to build the grounds. And then after looking at more as a use case, mm -hmm. meaning what what how can you make the world better basically by applying machine learning techniques and and there's a broad of things in the health industry you know doctors uh, finding new proteins was a big thing and, and it's still going on by the way things related also to energy energy is a big issue today finding these complex problems and how you can uh, understand better climate change yeah this is typically a very complicated problem for which there are so many parameters human cannot control and machines are well tailored for these type of very complex problems on which you have very a lot of parameters in which you need to do some prediction. Yeah. They just from my research I have have seen time and time again some of the smartest people in the world calling this particular technology or these series of technologies the most consequential, you know, emergence of tech in generations. Something that's truly going to, to change our world. Obviously we here in the UAE think about changing the world a lot. You know, we're surrounded by some of the, the greatest thinkers. You are over there at uh, TII helping to, to innovate. And you have recently made what a lot of people are calling a, a groundbreaking announcement of the Falcon uh, large language model. Explain Falcon to us in, in layman's terms how long has this project taken? Why did you do it? What, where is it today? And most importantly, where will it be in two years, five years from now? Yeah, so um, I joined TII roughly 18 months ago. Um, TII was established roughly more than two years ago with the will to have one of the biggest research applied centers in the MENA region. Uh, roughly we're 800 people today at TII. Wow, I didn't Not working only on AI, working on different topics, going from cryptography to quantum yep. to things like directed energy yep. or things like autonomous robotics. So when I came here, one of my goals was, of course, to build up what we call an AI cross-center unit, which was basically enabling some kind of, of platform to support all the different centers in terms of their problems, in terms of prediction. Quantum has some problems and others. But at the same time, we wanted to build something which was quite specific to the UAE in terms of going beyond machine learning and going into the field of reasoning. So we decided to kickstart a, a huge project called NOR before this Falcon LLM, which was one of the biggest, largest language model in Arabic. So Arabic, when we came here, was something which was missing in the sense that you can dialogue, make, or at least start a dialogue with the machine, yeah. completely like as if you were talking to your mother yeah. with all the background in Arabic. And so this is the thing that we started and we kickstarted with a lot of data that we had to acquire. And the UAE was a good place for that because basically there's the computing which was there. There was also the expertise. We have very good people working here. And also basically the kind of data that you could acquire with a lot of support that we got from the different stakeholders here in providing us the data in Arabic to be able to build that. So we built that and it was a big milestone which was achieved last year around February, uh, March and where we even issued the first article in Arabic. So in Itihad News, uh, we were asked for COP27, basically to write an article. So they gave us this a statement, and we had the first AI journalist, which wrote wow. that article. So that made a, a bit of a news for us. We were quite happy. But in between, we realized that 
we could do much more than that and build up some large language model which could do much more than that you know just like reason asking questions building codes and we decided to kickstart something called falcon llm and that falcon llm so this is only last year yeah last year yes yes right so you started this whole thing last year yes yeah we started it had a precursor, of course, but yeah, yeah. But I think the newer experience got yeah, a, got, yeah. got us a bit of, of hands on yes. to be able to know how we build those LLMs. Yeah, of course, Falcon L uh, Falcon LLM is an, another scale. Yeah, it is much another right. scale because it's something like Chat GPT yeah. that we were able to build, and where basically you can ask any kind of question. So you're going to ask uh, what is uh, what's going to happen, uh, what happened that year, or ask a report, things like, like things like that. So that was a big, a big, a big of, of of a challenge for us. And the announcement that we made like two weeks or three weeks, or two weeks ago, was a big, a big thing because big global headlines. Big global headlines because it was a model that was much doing much better than basically GPT three. So we were putting the UAE at the level of of DeepMind, of really? Google, of Facebook. Yeah. So that was a big thing for us. And at the same time, we empowered the UAE to have basically some model on which they can build now use cases in the future. I think, just, just sorry to interrupt. It's just one one thing. I was gonna I was struck by the the phrasing of um, being, you know, performance similar to ChatGPT. What? How do you assess that? Like, what is? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So today there are benchmarks. So it's the same as you. You, you take exams. So how can I assess that you're quite smart or intelligent? Of course, you, you could. You could. There are some exams that tell well, you. I'm how, sure you know that I'm not. I've spent. <laughs> Ten minutes so, <laughs> so we have benchmarks in the world yeah. related to these large language models. And so if you succeed on those tests, you have some ranking which are done based on those models. By the way, today, uh, GPT-3 is not the best model in the world. There are others who are making better, but it's most well known in our community today. But you have some tests and these benchmarks are done by Helm and other companies or uh, universities mainly. And there's a set of questions that you're going to prompt the system. Is and it the accuracy? Is the accuracy of the response? The yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really so it's what, like an exam. Yeah, yeah. So you take an exam and you get the answer, and if you're satisfied with the answer, it's pretty accurate. So a human would say this. Yeah. What do you say? So we think that you are becoming smart if you can answer these questions and you're accurate in those things. And so depending on the accuracy, that's how we assess the rank. And the the data that it actually reads from it does it basically just aggregate all of the information in the world on on the internet, for example. Yeah, exactly. And it's, takes from that, and that's that's where the the outputs come from. It it, it almost acts as like an, a filtration exercise. Yeah, so it, it's a bit of work because you access only public data. Of course, yeah. if you can be a company which has private data, you could do better, yeah. but you're, you're accessing all the public data over there. And based on that, you're training your machine based on all that data. And basically that machine then builds up a brain, which we call a model with a, c- a certain number of neurons, yep. which is our parameters. And in general, the bigger that model is, the better in, it is in terms of answering. So. When you look at ChatGPT, for example, it's not connected necessarily to internet. What I mean by that is it's a model that you can prompt. It's not going to search in internet to find the response because it's built up the brain and it's by itself going to give you the answer. And, and this is quite, quite impressive because, of course, it incurs an acceleration of the productivity today in our work. And, of course, this is why people are so happy because you see it. You ask uh, something as a report, you get it really done. But I want to ensure, I mean, sure, at least the people who are listening to us that, I mean, it's a game changer, but it's also all for the better. What I mean by that is that a big part of Chat GPT and Falcon LM is all about for humans how you prompt the machine. Prompting the machine meaning what you write as a question. Yeah. And so writing a question takes time because the way you write the question, you'll get a different answer. My mom has a very funny saying about this. She says, when you ask a silly question, you'll get a silly answer. Definitely. So she is a genius. And I must tell her. Exactly. Right. And and this is what I was was telling previously is that um, asking the right questions or putting the right statement is known in education that it's 99% of the work. Yeah. After 1% is just solving. Yeah. And so what we're converting now people in our society is that we don't want people to be any more problem solvers. Machines can do that. What you want people to do are people who can question and be problem makers. And this is a big transition that we're seeing even in education. Because basically, when you do the statement, it's just sends spending two years on your PhD, for example, to solve that problem. Yeah. But the big part of your PhD, or a master thesis, or a work, is defining the problem. I take a book. A book in itself, is you write it. 
but the big part of authors, they have what they call ghost writers. You know, people who write books for them. Yep. But still, the author is bringing a lot of ideas because he's putting into the statements, which are important, and then yep. there's somebody's writing it. This is what we're going to see more and more, is that people are going to spend time Think carefully. Thinking about big picture stuff. Big pic- picture stuff, big statement, trying to define clearly yeah. what you want to ask. And this takes time. We've been pa- spending too, too less time, I would say, in thinking that the question was irrelevant and the answer was was the important. But in fact, it's wow. the inverse. And- That's fascinating. That really is such a fascinating concept. Um, we are, I think, running out of time, but I in the last sort of five, seven minutes that we've got, we're in a financial center. So you're in the, the ADGM, the financial center of Abu Dhabi. And, you know, the financial services sector, the financial markets really are the machinery that helps drive global economies. Can you think of any sort of applications to finance financial services that, that AI could, you know, have like banks, for example, are a, just a big aggregator of data. Yeah, just counting numbers all day long. Where where does AI intersect with finance? So, so this is a very good question. So l- there are two things there. A lot of people think that um, in terms of prediction of stock and things like that, these machine learning tools or LLMs would work. They're not working so well there because basically these LLM cannot predict any kind of event which has never happened in the world, especially something really unexpected. A war, for example, are things which are unexpected and you know the impact of a war on the stock market. So these kind of things are not well basically tailored to LLMs. However, a big part of the financial market is basically being able to get accurate information. There's so much information which is dispersed, you don't have time to look at all these sheets, uh, data sheets of all companies, looking at where the things and to cross that information. By running these sheets on LLMs, large language models, and of course you can have some kind of interface that on which you can ask any kind of questions and you can get relevant information to help you in your investment. And this is, I think, a big part of the things. Of course, there's going to be much more interfaces in terms of how you discuss with chatbots, things like that. Yeah. But the fact that we are going to get more and more, a lot of global information and, you know, the more information you know about what's happening in Argentina yeah. da, 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 and the impact of Argentina, because maybe in the, there's there's no uh, rain at that time. The fact that the raining was not happening could have an impact on some kind of trading that you'll do in Europe, mm-hmm. which is possibly the case. These kind of things a human cannot capture because it's too much information yeah. which is spread. LLMs will have a huge impact in that financial sector in terms of providing you reliable information, reliable advice, and being able to aggregate all that information in a very constructive manner, just asking in response. Yeah, I think I, one of the previous episodes of this uh, this podcast that we done, I interviewed. A, a chap who focuses on, from Themis, it focuses on financial security, financial crime, things like that. There's, I think, two or three percent of global GDP is lost every year to malevolent actors in financial services. I think AI will certainly help us to make financial systems more secure because it helps us to close loops that otherwise wouldn't necessarily be. Do you think that that has some application? Well, in fact, surprisingly, the most of the people who started using ChatGPT are mostly people from the cybersecurity domain. Ah, oh, interesting. Because of course, of all the the phishing emails that you can create, and and of course responses. So detecting vulnerabilities, for example, trying to analyze them, trying to patch them, is exactly what these LLMs can do. So of course, yeah, it's going to be of course providing more and more reliable software. It's going to be able to detect faster these things. But at the same time, you can have offensive techniques which are being built on that. So it's a quite interesting time yeah. where people are going to abuse the system to make more offensive, basically, type of, of attacks. And of course, a whole realm of people trying to use these tools to be able to go at the speed of light to detect. Because the problem with today is that whenever you have a hack or vulnerabilities, you're infected in billions of computers or devices at the same time things go at the speed of light. So no human can be behind anymore. Yeah. So you need basically intelligence, which works for you in being able to 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 just look at all that. Uh, this this brings me to what I think is my, my last question on this. This is a really powerful idea. It's a really powerful, it's not even an idea anymore, it's a reality. Yeah. And like all powerful 
ideas they can be used for good and be used for bad and as a researcher how do you feel that the ethics question should be handled you know how how do we how do we maximize the opportunities for society to these technologies and, and mitigate the risks what does that look like yeah i think with chat gpt we have uh, an even more bigger responsibility to what we're doing uh um I think the concept of OpenAI started with that, and as you can see, it changed a bit. Uh, the people who started OpenAI had this concept of, of course, making the world better, open, and basically we're, we're doing it for society. It turns out that the stakes were too high and these things have changed. And I think now, regulations, being able to make sure that uh, ethics is, is behind, is the responsibility of the big people who are making it. Of course, the first thing of ethics that you start building is, is with data. That's the first thing you, you start with. And of course, that already puts you in some kind of responsibility in, in the sense of which kind of data you can use, which, can, which kind of data is public, which kind of data is not public, yep. what are the biases you, you incur in the system. And I think today there is a need of more and more people who are taking care of all the regularity aspects about building these LLMs. And I think the researchers by themselves are in general for a pushy to get those things. But this, I think, has happened in any science, by the way. Of course, yeah, I was yeah. just thinking that. Yeah, yeah if, you take, if you take the 40s, 45, I think we're at the same time, there was a big revolution, 40, 45, nuclear happened. Yes. Scientists asked themselves many questions about, you know, um, what my work, is it about destroying or helping yeah. the world? And I think we're at each stage, of course, we're asking these questions. Now it's just the speed at which things go makes it that, of course, the questions are even harsher that we need to solve right now. Yeah. But mankind always finds a way to end up in a good place, I think. Definitely, definitely. And I think we're just scratching the surface. I think also the mankind at the moment is also thinking too much on a closed setting. You have, you don't, must not forget that we live in universe. There's going to be much more AI also embedded in robots, which are going to go in space, which are great opportunities for us. Nobody can conquer Mars for the moment for us. It's going to be too, too far. We need machines embedded like humans who can take decisions there to construct bases for us. Very good. The conquest of the, of the universe is still there. And I think these are great opportunities where we should not hinder the progress, but look at much bigger things which are waiting for us in the future. I think I'm about to say wow for the fifth time <laughs> <laughs> in this in this conversation we've we've run out of time um as i said at the beginning i think this could have went on for a long time um i'm sorry we can't but uh, thank you very much for for coming along to adgm today to explain the principles of artificial intelligence to us you've done so uh certainly i i feel like i understand it a little bit better um it's obviously still at the beginning of something really big it's really profound um but you know thinkers like you are uh, are helping to make the difference so Thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you for the opportunity.